Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 27 of Humanity Rising. Every day since the 22nd of May, for two hours between 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock p.m. Central European time, we've made available literally a global commons so that people from around the world and from all walks of life can come together to share their experiences of the pandemic and to take counsel together as to how we can more effectively give shape to a sustainable post-pandemic world. We started by listening to the voices of women and youth. And then over the last uh, 10 days or so, we dove into the critical question of how people of goodwill around the world can work together effectively enough to actually make a difference in the post-pandemic world. That's the most important conversation I think there is in the world right now. Scientists and diplomats the world over are telling us that we're running out of time. We have runaway climate change, massive levels of species extinction, deforestation, ecological toxification happening all around the world. And how we come together literally over the next 10 years by 2030, according to a growing consensus, the most critical time in all of human history, when we're either going to save the world or we may well lose it. And the pandemic we're now in the middle of is showing us just how fragile humanity really is. A little microbe stopped our world. And gave us the biggest opportunity of our lives. We come today to, in some ways, the most intractable, complicated, and potentiated part of our discussion. And that is how business can help create a better future. I say intractable because ever since business began thousands of years ago, people have justified doing almost anything to the environment and almost anything to other people to generate profit. It's an extraordinary thing if you look back over history the sacrifices that we have made to nature and to our fellow human beings for business. And how business transitions to a force for good could not be more important because maybe in the end, it's business that has to do it. And so this conversation today, I think is, is an important one as we draw uh, this first program of strategies for change uh, uh, to a close. Uh, business over the last uh, several decades has begun to wake up and the acceleration of good ideas, this acceleration of, of sustainable business, regenerative business, business basically for good in the world, socially responsible business, B Corp uh, phenomenon, social benefit corporations, uh, is a new phenomenon in history. And it's coming into play at our most critical moment. So how we nurture this in a world that is now dominated by business. And that's worth accentuating as we begin. 
for most of human history, it was the priest and the king that dominated. But over the last 200 years, for the first time, it's not the priest, it's not the king that determines. It is business. Corporations now rule the world. And at the center of the corporations are literally a handful of egregiously wealthy billionaires that are worth most of the rest of humanity combined. So when we talk about business for change, let us just bear in mind the context of the supremacy of business in the world. As our corporate elites tell the governments what to do. And that's why I said at the beginning that this conversation about how business can change the world may be the most important fulcrum we can exercise as we enter the most important decade in our collective journey on this planet. So thank you all for joining. And uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Peter Mary, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, who will commence the program. Peter. Thanks, Jim. Yep, great to be back with our <clears throat> strategies for change um, as we round up these 10 days of really asking the hard questions about, about the how of this transition. How are we going to make the scale of impact at the speed of change that we know is necessary? And, the, and, and you can't have that conversation without including the question of business and enterprise. Um, in one of the earlier panels in the strategy session, we were having a conversation about the difference, one of the important differences between business and government being that business is very, uh, government is very loath to take risks and generally very conservative. And yet what we need at this time is a lot of experimentation, a kind of massive R&D of humanity, really to try out new ways and see what works and experiment with the kind of solutions that we need for the future. And the possibility to do that lives much more in the business sector than it does in the public sector, where generally risks are avoided. So there is a huge opportunity within the business sector to make a positive difference. And we've got a very interesting and a diverse panel today who I think are gonna give us many different perspectives and then hopefully be able to dive in with each other uh, in the dialogue see if we can get to some powerful collective insights about uh, the role of business in this transition. I'll introduce them in detail as we, uh, as we go through the program, but just to give you an overview now, we have uh, Ossa Sandberg, and this is the order that we, the people will come in, um, who is out of uh, Sweden, uh, Robert Rubenstein, uh, who's based in Amsterdam, here where I am as well, and uh, uh, Tia Kansara, who's in London, uh, Andrea Page, who I only just discovered is actually in Hawaii, where it's 4.30, or nearly 5 o'clock in the morning. So thank you to her for taking the effort to join. And uh, Scylla Elworthy is coming to us at the moment from the north of England in the Lake District, one of my favorite places on the planet. So welcome to you all. Thanks very much for joining us today. And um, without further ado, let's uh, kick off with uh, Osso Sandberg. Uh, who um, was introduced via the Impact Hub network, I think, originally, uh, Ossa, and, um, and I think it, who, who the introduction framed two pieces. One, the work that you'd actually done internally in an organization to try to make it shift, particularly the co-op, I think, uh, in Sweden, and then how you went on to set up your own company, <clears throat> work with uh, Too Good To Go as the country manager, uh, in Sweden. So you've seen both sides of it from the entrepreneur trying to change the system from the inside 
uh, to the entrepreneur trying to set up an alternative, which as Buckminster Fuller would say, to make the old system obsolete. So um, Asa, over to you. Uh, looking forward to hearing your, your story. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for uh, allowing me to speak uh, at this uh, really great gathering of uh, people. Uh, so I will just um, uh, shed some light on uh, the work that we're doing now and so social entrepreneurship and exactly what you said, Peter, I've seen it from both angles, both as an intrapreneur and also an entrepreneur. Um, so I would like to just share my thoughts uh, on the experience that I have, but also the, the needs that I see going forward. Um, and um, I want to first touch on where I actually am right now and really shine a light on the social entrepreneurship and where that's needed. Um, and obviously, that where I am right now at Too Good To Go, we are a social impact company, meaning that we are really about the purpose and we are actually creating our solutions based on the purpose and the problems that we see. So uh, I want you to actually imagine something. So imagine that you're going home really early, hungry, sorry, and you're planning to, to eat a pizza, but uh, for just... 12 euros you get yourself a really delicious hawaii pizza and you're like all set to attack it but now it turns out that your ice was just a little bit bigger than your belly and one third of the pizza is actually left so that's actually one third of all the vegetables and the cheese on there and the pineapple and the crusty pizza baits they have really been produced for nothing uh, it's been processed for nothing, it's been transported and wrapped for nothing, and it's also been heated for nothing. And secondly, on the way home, you actually are likely to pass a person who is hungry who, and who would actually love to get a little bite of your pizza, but it's a shame that you have already thrown it away, even though it was delicious. And last but not least, you paid 12 euros for this pizza, but you basically just threw away four euros out of the window. So now this might all sound a little bit weird, but you probably recognize it, right? Um, and this is really what food waste is all about and the impact that we do and that all the billion of people in the world actually do on an everyday basis. So I want to introduce first the food waste into it, which is really where Too Good To Go is so strong and the, what, what we wake up to every day to solve. Uh, you might not realize food waste is actually a massive issue. Every year, like one third of the food that we produce globally is thrown away. That's 1.6 billion tons or actually 50 tons every second, which is a huge number. It might even be hard to get a sense what 50 tons actually is, but it is actually the size of 10 elephants a second. So that's really what it is. It's huge. Um, and it's not just food. It's actually indeed a big issue from at least three different perspectives. It's both the environmental side. So 8% of all the greenhouse emissions are estimated to come from food waste from food wasted, not from food, but from food wasted. So that there's a good reason why the SDG 12 aims to cut food waste in half by 2030. Um, and in fact, if food waste were a country, it would be the third biggest polluter in the world after the US and China. And then we also have the social aspects of thing. Uh, actually, we, pro we produce more than enough food to feed everybody, but yeah, like millions, 870 million people go to bed hungry every day. And for me, that is my biggest why to why I am really trying to change this uh, agenda, not just in Sweden, but also globally. Um, and economically, it's also huge. The value of food lost or waste that is actually $1.2 trillion every year. So you see it's a huge issue. And why am I telling you this as a background? Well, the background is important because uh, four years ago, 
um, a few uh, a few European entrepreneurs they came they came together because they realized that this was a huge problem a huge problem globally not just in one country but globally and they started the dialogue to see what can we actually do about this um, like they didn't have a solution they didn't have the app which we now have but they knew that there was a huge global issue and they wanted to solve it they wanted to be part of the solution so indeed when they had discussed it further they all went home to the separate countries and this app was developed the app which is now too good to go which is actually the solutions which today have saved more than 39 million meals and uh, th and this to me is amazing and um, to work in a company which is so value driven and it really is social entrepreneurship and it's not a profit business so it's we don't put profit first we're not a business which just are about making profit we are a business with actually a focus on the impact that we are making the kpi that we are measured on is actually saved meals every day every month and every year um, and actually looking at it, the, the model that we have created, the entrepreneurship that we have actually created is so scalable, both the model in itself and how much food we can actually save, but also food waste is actually all across the value chain from every stages from farm, farm to fork. And normally when you see photos of food waste, it's like a big food waste bin outside a supermarket or a farmer standing in front of like huge rotten mountains of tomato. But that's partly true. Like 35% of our food goes to waste before it actually reaches our stores. That is so much else. And we are actually talking about behavioral shifts. Like, I don't know how many of you actually listening here that heard in the, you know, when you were young to finish up your plate before you could leave the table. I, I at least did. But then something happened and we stopped passing that on to the next generation and young people grew up with such an abundance of food. So there is so many reasons for us uh, having food waste, but this is where I see that we now need to shift. So we need to actually shift a norm and we also need to shift behavior. And in order to shift behavior, new businesses and new strategies are needed. And when we connect this, to the pandemic that we are all affected by, uh, of course. There was a survey done in UK and actually it showed that only 9% of adults want everything to go back to how it was before, 9%. And like people are trying new things since the outbreak of COVID-19, sorry, and people are noticing new things as well since the outbreak. And that demands for new businesses and new strategies. Um, and I, I always talk about to motivate people and actually motivate the team that I have now uh, that are really fighting the food waste warrior fight with me every day we speak a lot about the why and we speak a lot about why we are waking up every day and going to work and it's not for none of us it's about making a pro like making a profit it is about making an impact and yes you can do that at the same time you can make money but you can also do it and turn it into something good so what i'm saying is it doesn't have to be either or but we have seen, like studies have shown, that social businesses and social entrepreneurship and actually putting purpose first has both a positive effect on employees and also a positive effect on consumers uh, and numbers of other reasons. So seeing it, like being able to do this at to Good To Go and really build that environment, I've never worked in a company which has so much value and is so value driven. And just to touch on Peter, what you said as well uh, about uh, co-op and where I actually had saw it from the other side, it was super interesting. And being an entrepreneur for many years, it was really interesting and also useful for me to actually take a peek into 
the other world and really understand how that actually works. Uh, but I think that we need to, like, we really need to stop working so much in silos and have understanding for each other's businesses. Because if you are a company and you want to attract talent and also really come on board and be a new business and adapt to the future, yes, you do need to involve the entrepreneurs, but you also need to be adapted to the entrepreneurs and really actually facilitate their to do what they are best at. And that is being entrepreneurs and being thought leaders. And if you are an old business, um, then you need to make space and really adapt to that new, that, that new coming in. So um, I'm, it was a very, very valuable um, lesson for me and also insights to be on the other side and being an, an entrepreneur, if you wish, and really try to shift that change. Um, from an internal point of view, but now having the platform that Too Good To Go, to go actually has, um, not just in Sweden, we are on 14 markets at this point and we are growing fast, going really fast and we will be in US um, like at the end of this year, at it looks. Um, I wake up every day and I'm so proud of the work that we do. And I'm so proud that we can be a part of a solution that really, really helps solving a huge global issue. Um, and that every little meal that we save actually helps. And if you're out there and you are considering like being an entrepreneur and you know, but you don't really know where to go and what to do about it. I would just say, like, go in, go into yourself and think about your wife and your actual purpose and then jump at it. Because there is no better feeling than actually waking up every morning and making a difference. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Asa. Very inspiring. Very inspiring. A great energy to kick us off with. Um, so we'll come, we can come back to some of the, the kind of questions and points you raised in the, in the dialogue. I've noted down a few things that would be interesting to, to pick up on, but a uh, very inspiring story and uh, plenty of recognition in the chat as well. So uh, good to see. Thank you very much. So um, uh, now in, uh, invite Robert uh, Rubenstein to tell us his story and Robert from, you know, I've, I don't know how long I've been on your mailing list, Robert, but I think it's quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and before they, there was email yeah right <laughs> has kind of really dedicated his life to this question of um how to transform business to be more positive in terms of sustainability and impact um and uh, tbli is the probably most well-known uh, vehicle through which you're doing that i should think um but i'll leave you to tell the story uh, robert yourself thanks very much uh, for joining us and love to hear your perspective on on the levers, as it were, the acupuncture points to be able to transform business uh, to make mm -hmm. the greatest possible change as effectively as we can. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for those of you who don't know TBLI, it's in for triple bottom line investing. And my wife likes to say uh, that uh, we make dreams come true, but we're not in cosmetics. So our work is really mainly to make the financial system work for all by educating and advising uh, investors, investment allocators, service providers in the financial sector. And the reason why I chose the financial sector is that uh, I started the first magazine in Europe, publishing magazine, magazine on sustainability management magazine. And I saw when that magazine stopped, uh, I still wanted to create an economy based on well-being. And to do that, you needed to have the business community on board. But the business community now and then only responds to pain to change directions. So I looked at which are the pain buttons, the acupuncture buttons I could press to get their attention. And I chose finance because at the time, and the same now, the concentration of wealth was in a very few number of hands. I looked at the list of the top asset owners, managers, the top 100 had direct or indirect control of about 20 to 25% of the, the money. So I figured 
this was not a PhD study. If I just, I need to convince a hundred guys because there were no women at the top then um, about sustainable investment. So that's why I started the conference and all the other activities to help educate those uh, asset owners. And fortunately, there is no group more predictable than the financial sector. They all run up the hill and off the cliff at the same time. So the behavioral change has never really been a challenge. I mean, we're used to, when we started 25 years ago and having done 38 conferences and countless other lectures and magazines and things like that, uh, there was no PRI, CDP, impact investing, gin. There was nothing, it was a barren uh, wasteland. So we were used to working with the Donald Trump types, the mainly irresponsible investors and criminals who were not interested or didn't understand what uh, ESG or impact investing or investing that looks at all of the risks, social, environmental, and financial, as well as governance. But once, you, once we started to do this work, the behavioral change was never really hard. It was actually quite easy. Um, but the hard part was access. People with a lot of money, with a lot of zeros, are very isolated. The more zeros, more isolation. And they have lots of handlers and moats around them to keep news and people and things out. So that's always been the challenge. But if you ask anybody, do you want a financial return with a social environmental added value? I've never heard anyone say, no, I want all my money to make life miserable for everybody. And I'm working at that 24 seven. So when, when, by focusing on the financial sector because of the large concentration, you don't need to convince many people. And if the financial sector starts to realize, hey, we should not be lending money to carbon intensive industry because carbon is now a cost and it's gonna affect us, our reputation, things like that. The same with what's happening now in, with Black Lives Matter. All of a sudden, all of these corporates are very, very concerned about um, integration, uh, gender diversity, um, racism, when, because it's affecting their bottom line. So that's the pain pressure. And the financial sector, uh, they always follow the money. You know, if you, if you can show them that there is interest. So what we have now, we have many things coming together. We have carbon as a cost. We have the millennials that don't want their money invested in a certain way. They don't want to work for companies this way. The best and the brightest don't want to work anymore for financial institutions that don't align with their values. You have lots of demand because looking at all of the risk is actually a better way of managing money. So all of this combining to create this massive uh, tidal wave of interest and money, money flow. That's where you keep hearing so much about impact investing. Unfortunately, the financial sectors, particularly since the crisis, they've only spent money on cybersecurity, ICT, compliance, capital buffers, and bonuses. They've spent nothing, zero, even less than zero, on capacity building of staff, internally or externally or clients. That's why it's taken so long. At the same time, you have a schizophrenia of the financial sector, which does not want to be seen, except for a very small group, they don't want to be seen as the sustainable bank, but they don't want to be not seen as a sustainable bank. So they don't make any real serious commitment. It's like saying, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be partly pregnant. You know, you are, you aren't. And all of this has slowed the process down, but we're now having a lot of interest. Unfortunately, people have to be quite um, critical because the ones that are doing the most, they're talking the least. And the ones doing the least are talking the most. You see it very clearly, you know, the four mega banks of the US, they fund 40% of all fossil fuel investments. But at the same time, their press releases keep talking about sustainable investment. Um, so always look at what companies are doing, not what they're saying. Uh, don't invest your money uh, in products that don't align with your values. Don't work for companies that don't align with your value. This is how you change behavior. I remember you teaching MBA students and they all wanted to change the company that they were gonna work for. And I said, 
don't think you're going to change the company, but from inside. You should interview the recruiter, as Larry David in Curb Your Enthusiasm did with Leon. You should turn it around. If the, if the recruiter doesn't uh, answer your question about the values of the company, don't work there. That has much more leverage than trying to work in the company. So our focus has always been the, the money flows we tried with on the, the personnel side, it's always finance, personal reputation are the leverage, the acupuncture leverage for changing business. Um, but we stayed with finance mainly because with a little bit of effort, you can get a lot done. Uh, and I'm happy that there are significant chatter about ESG and impact investing, but at the same time, how can we have a situation where the financial sector, the GINs and, and US SIF and Euro SIF are claiming 35, close to $40 trillion in ESG money when every single living organism, every metric you can think of, climate, carbon, food security, water, uh, racism, everything is only getting worse. So either that money is not being allocated or the definition is completely skewed, or we have to double down. Either way, until now, unfortunately, I've come to the realization that ESG is just going slower in the wrong direction. And we need a fundamental uh, shift in what is a sustainable investment, and we need to increase those money flows. And that's what I've dedicated most of our time. That's what TBLI stands for. So thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, key part of the puzzle uh, there. So looking forward to connecting that up to the uh, others as we explore. Now, how do these, as we're sensing into these different acupuncture points or levers uh, for change, how do they connect up? How can they support each other um, to be able to really make that systemic change that we need? Um, just a reminder to people, if you are, if you're wanting to share in the chat, feel free, go ahead, make sure you do select all panelists and attendees. It's automatically set to just all panelists. So if you might be sending messages that you only want the panelists to see, that's fine. But if you want others who are listening to see as well, make sure you select all panelists and attendees. Great. So next, uh, Tia Kansara. Uh, welcome Tia, uh, joining us from, uh, London. Um, there was so much in your profile that I uh, didn't know what to say really, except <laughs> being uh, you know an entrepreneur, um, very focused on sustainability, an author, a teacher, multiple awards in that area. Um, so feel free to tell us whatever you think is relevant. Um, but uh, great to have you with us, and uh, and curious to hear what your you know. There's so much I think you probably could say. So what is your particular take on? this question of, of impact through business. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, well, you know, hello, and lovely to meet you all. And thank you all at Ubiquity. I can't believe, Peter, we met two years ago and one of your colleagues wrote me a message and, and asked whether I'd like to join. And it was funny because I'd heard of Ubiquity through you and our conversation. And in the email was written, um, not at the moment, but how about in two years time? And it's funny because uh, nice full circle there. So thank you very much for the invitation, Peter. And also Jim, lovely vision that you set up, um, amazing thoughts already. I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for your time and connection. I very much hope that we'll have a super lively discussion afterwards. So please keep all of your questions ready or share them now. Um, you know, when we're trying to understand how business works, we need to begin from the foundation up. Uh, how does business start? Uh, what were the elements that affected the growth of it? For example, take capitalism. How do we all become capitalists from reinforcing the system? And if it wasn't our choice, how do we continue to fuel capitalism with our actions? I very much believe that every time we purchase something within a system, we invest in its growth. And um, I feel like it's a, a plant that we carry on, like a weed we don't really want, but we carry on feeding it. Um, although some would argue that the weeds are the diversity um, of you know, our, our nature uh, and that when we monocrop, these weeds um, are, com are coming up because they need to uh, show themselves as the sort of um, 
biodiversity of, of the planet. So it's a really fascinating concept when we, um, you know, give nutrients to something that we don't really want. And it's a fascinating expectation that we have that it should and shouldn't grow in terms of the economic system that we're in at the moment. We've expected a, a linear growth. Um, and much of that kind of reading can be found in the Meadows book, Beyond Limits to Growth. And, um, you know, a really fascinating read for any of you that are interested. Um, we encourage uh, companies uh, that are doing bad by buying their products. Um, and if we continue to do that, um, you know, we need to really understand where we can stop, um, start again, uh, refresh ourselves and build these alternative businesses and systems where we have a choice and where we can say no. So, you know, just looking at this triangle, it sort of really started me off thinking in terms of what is the philosophy that we keep on reinforcing? And if that is capital accumulation or the idea and identity that we've associated with um, an asset, a holding, a control, a property, then the exchange of that is the economic system that we've generated. That system then turns into the design that we use as the sort of formula or the program within the system that we're creating. So when it comes to products and services that are in cities where we exchange goods and services based on the economic trade, uh, we're reinforcing this, you know, this, this idea of capital. Um, but if we are to, you know, really shift our perception and as you know, um, Jim and Peter have sort of directed us, um, and many of us have been working in this field already. My deeper concern is, um, you know, how can we account for business that has a negative impact on the environment? And as economists, we call that externalities, the negative externalities of, of a system or a business. Um, but really, a lot of my time I've spent trying to answer this question and recognizing that if we don't go to the philosophy, the programming system, then it makes us makes it really difficult for us to understand how to shift the entirety if we don't go to the foundational step. So what we've learned is that this philosophy of capital accumulation has really left a lot of our capital in heaps in places called landfill sites. So our capital is around, it's just in the wrong place. Um, so <laughs> when we are designing products and services through sustainability as an afterthought, we create these grandiose plans of um, CSR departments that, you know, when we were first starting off in sustainability, perhaps that was the beginning of the, you know, the spurt that we required to understand that, hey, look, you know, we've done really well for ourselves. Now we need to really consider the impact to society and the environment. Um, but actually this is because we're so out of sync with the environment that it doesn't really matter that sustainability is an afterthought. Um, a lot of my work to design sustainable business models has taught me that although density, like in cities, a lot of my work is in the built environment, so future of cities, architecture, community architecture, um, a lot of the density that we um, favoured for such a long time to have access to great services, amenities, etc. Um, they require larger environments to support them. Uh, products require supply chains even further afield to support them with, you know, incredible loss to log logistical supports during times like the pandemic. So how do we pandemic proof our businesses um, whilst also being mindful of climate proofing our businesses? If we need to create environments to live and work that are better suited to the kinds of risks that we're going to be expecting, then how can we mitigate against them? So societies require those sort of shifts to live in harmony with nature by giving more than we're taking, because if we don't account for or the environmental degradation, then of course, sustainability isn't um, you know, a forethought. We're not designing that philosophy into what we do. So a potential shift in the way we design products and services really helps us to uh, create um, you know, ways to design products and services that go beyond what we've ever done before. So it can be done because we've designed it. Um, you know, if you were to look at houses, well, it, you know, yes, we have standards, regulations, um, lead platinum, BRIAM, and all of these other methodologies. And we can have regulations in any industry. I'm just giving you an example of the built environment, that these are standards that have been created. Humanity has created this, just like we've created a door, we've created computers. So it's not a design issue. It's the fact that we have in ourselves the ability to 
reimagine the way that we'd like it to, uh, to be. So really living in harmony with nature is about shifting our lifestyles. Um, it's about understanding where we can have impact. And it's about creating businesses that protect the global commons. Obviously, somebody may ask what's the global communal space. Um, economics fundamentally looks at the tragedy of these communal spaces through which actors like you or me, consumers like you or me, um, may or may not have an impact that's negative on these communal spaces. So if we are both farmers and there's a patch of grass or a pasture that we go and feed our cows on, who's to say that, that you feeding more of, of your cows along that pasture and not leaving any for me will be uh, accounted for in the economic system. That tragedy is what we're experiencing today. So if you have a business that has an impact that's negative on the environment, polluting the environment, then who's to point a finger at you and tell you stop doing it? Just like we have, I think it's in the Blue Planet um, series that David Attenborough brought out, talking about the number of rivers that, that across the world are carrying huge amounts of waste to the oceans. And we see that above the, you know, on the surface of the ocean with these gyres. But what about under water? Something that we don't see, we don't account for what's on the, you know, on the, uh, the, the bottom soil of the ocean. So really reinforcing this kind of innovation is important for communities to build um, the kind of buildings and cities and systems that we need. But also we often don't think that we need to bridge these systems. We kind of like want to kill it and I appreciate the desire to kill something but I think we're in that period that by bridging it and like Ken Wilber likes to say include and transcending it we go beyond what we've ever done before so technology really becomes a tool for implementation or augmentation so at Kinsara Hackney Limited but also at Replenish Earth we architect these eco buildings and cities to invest in that sort of bottom-up innovation um, and we develop this mentality and program about decentralizing decentralizing these decisions by bringing as many people as we can up to you know the invitation to the table to sit uh, and have these kinds of discussions so you know a lot of our work um, across the SDGs is so that we're not choosing one SDG over the others right it's, oh you know I do SDG number two but what about the rest of them so you know this is a, a very big question and here's um the replenished business canvas that I often share with as many people as possible to really start thinking about how we can design businesses which have sustainability as a forethought rather than an afterthought, not thinking about it afterwards, thinking about it so that you're designing your products and services in alignment with this. At the moment, we've got a project with Garmont, which is a, an outdoor wear company in Italy, who's interested in uh, completely shifting some of their shoes, as an example, um, towards 100% biodegradable they're 20 percent away from being 100 percent biodegradable and that's incredible so you know a lot of people ask well we've recycled all of our products yes okay appreciate that you've created a product out of recycled plastic now when a person has is is finished with this product what do you do with it so you're only delaying the time that it goes to a landfill site. We've worked with a number of these kinds of companies across the world, from Coca-Cola to, um, you know, Siemens. And, you know, we've really understood that this kind of an impact really has to spread across a variety of different industries. And, you know, if I look at some of the work that I did in the Middle East for my PhD, I recognize that something close to, you know, Two billion people across the world are living in what one would call, um, you know, informal settlements. So the future is looking pretty grim if we're not including them in our designs. A lot of the sequestration that we're looking at is only of one greenhouse gas. But of course, you know, there are many other forms of pollution that, that we're not really aware of. So a lot of the work that I've done is to try and bring governments, uh, consumers or just citizens to become aware of how they can make those kinds of decisions through policy and where it is that you spend your money. But also to recognize that there is this, this gap there that 
isn't really the parental code that your parents teach you and isn't really the government code that the government teaches you. And so, you know, in, in technology like blockchain, you would call that the last mile where it's really good up until a point, but then it's like the last bit that needs to be delivered and everything is accounted for up until that point, but who then looks after the last bit. So these sorts of environmental shifts require the entire structure from start to finish to be included in the, the shift. So some of the work that I did in, in Abu Dhabi was to look at these kinds of built environments. At the bottom left, you'll see Mazdar City, which was the first, hailed the first zero carbon, zero waste city. Of course, over time, an economic disruption that happened in 2010, something close to, I think it was something close to 10 billion that was that was used from Abu Dhabi to bail out Dubai during the credit crisis had a huge impact on just the building of, of this city. So it was a vision that was designed by Foster and partners, and they had to readjust for the consequences of people not wanting to live there. One of the reasons being that people like to have cars. And of course, in 60 degrees Celsius outside, you're not going to be walking down the street, are you? So you can only imagine that these kinds of grandiose schemes have huge impacts on the environment because surely you'd ask the question, why would you build something in an environment that is a desert? Where are you going to bring everything from? And at the beginning of the actual project, which is what my PhD was, was based on, was to understand how are you going to make this a sustainable business model? And of course it isn't. And that's the reason why you haven't seen it sort of expand um, to the full scale of the design of the city. So businesses have this opportunity of pivoting and, and in my business at the moment, we've really pivoted with regards to the built environment because who wants to live in an environment that they're isolated? Who wants to be so far away from the, the community that's important to them? So we're designing these kinds of public spaces and facilities around housing that can be retrofitted for other pur purposes during the pandemic. We're looking at air quality, of course, because of the aerosol in um, the, the viral sort of aerosol. Uh, we're looking at uh, well-being indoors, looking at quarantine areas that you can retrofit in your homes, in offices, and recognizing that the entire map of cities has been designed for that kind of density, which then produces an entire infrastructure uh, that is not aligned with what we need to be mitigating crises for. So there is a huge amount of availability of business. And I think this is just you know, one example of the built environment, but every single industry needs to have an entire shift. And the World Economic Forum recently mentioned uh, that GDP is not the best measure of success. Thank you. You know, 1930s um, Nobel Prize that was awarded for gross domestic product not being associated to the negative externalities was the biggest issue in the measure or the lack of measure towards the environmental accountability that we've needed to have. So, yes, there are a number of accounting measures, ecosystem services that you can have or green taxes. But fundamentally, we need to be designing businesses that are supportive of our environment. Here's another really you know, interesting project that the world economic forum has has started beyond gdp um you know well-being not being measured by gdp if you were to take smoking for example if you buy a cigarette it looks really good on your gdp because someone's purchased something equally if you were to go to the hospital and have to have a new pair of lungs because you know um over the course of 30 years of chain smoking you've had um bad health that also looks really good on, on GDP because it's a purchase of a new set of lungs. So it's a really interesting conundrum of what is, what is it that we're actually measuring and what do we need to do about it? I know that I'm out of time. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about this book. Uh, we put this together a couple of years ago. It's with Jaime Lerner um, and a, a couple of other really interesting, fascinating people. It's very short. Um, if you take a picture of the QR code, you'll um, have the MailChimp uh, registration page. And if you sign up, you'll get a copy of the, the book for free. It's available on Amazon to purchase as well. We have a number of upcoming courses. I really strongly believe that we need to make sustainability our business. <laughs> um, and also think that, you know, there's a number of other ways that you can get involved. You can explore your own methodology for this. There's a um, um, a webinar that I did recently with impact and it's available for free, but you can go through your core values through the actual process of the webinar. Um, I also made a, a quick note that of course, if you want to get in contact with me, you're welcome to on, um, the website. Uh, there is a link there. And if there's anything that I can be helpful with, please let me know. Thank you. 
Hey, thank you, Tina. What a what a whirlwind! <laughs> uh, amazing um, work you've been involved in and, and insights, and uh, and hopefully we'll be able to build on that conversation we had while you were cycling through London, um, and see how we can connect some of this into uh, into ubiquity. It'd be great if some of these resources that you've mentioned <clears throat> we can put into the Ubiverse. So we'll make sure that the profile uh, is set up there and that we can share all of this into the library um, where the all the recordings are being hosted. And then if you're able to share the slides as well, we'll put those there too so people can find and follow up. Yeah, with link. pleasure. Magic. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And uh, okay, oh, it looks like there's some sun that's come up there, uh, Andy. <laughs> So uh, moving on to Andy Page, describes herself on her uh, profile as a futurist. Um, I've also seen that you speak many languages, seven languages already. So great job. I'm to be a linguist myself originally. It does somehow plug you into the world in a, in a different way. Um, and uh, really focused on the um, businesses around a positive lifestyle, essentially. Let me put it that broadly, that makes a positive impact across the board. And uh, so feel free to tell us a bit more if you want, but uh, thanks for getting up so early anyway and, uh, and joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for hosting and thank you to everyone for your participation and listening. Uh, I wanna see, I'll see, maybe at the end I'll be able to focus, but you can see the ocean behind me. I'm speaking to you right now from Maui, uh, blessings from Hawaii, mahalo, uh, this sense of unconditional love and presence with all things that are. Um, and you'll hear many different birds and other sounds in the background as I'm speaking to you now. Um, and that's really just part of the game when you live in connection with nature. And where we've come uh, from definitely a capitalist business sense is deep, deep, deep disconnection and a sense of isolation. And that isolation has driven not only uh, the economy to a place where the environment and human health are uh, not valued, right? But moreover, the moment that our health uh, became a commodity as well as our food, that was really the decline of our species. Uh, because then, you know, those things aren't valued for their intrinsic value. They're valued as numbers on a paper. And so, um, I'm a polymath, which means I do many different things, not a specialist, but a generalist. Uh, I am a naturopathic doctor and I had a whole career in health and about three and a half years ago, I left that to start to work in futurist technologies and artificial intelligence and really what's beyond AI. Um, and today, the title of my little section for you is Incentive Structures, Collaboration and Wellness in a Post-Capitalist Workplace. Uh, now, in my undergraduate time, I was a polit political economist and I was looking at uh, the way that we set up societies. And I traveled to several intentional communities all around the world to try to find, like, how could we do something else? Because I, at the age of 19, figured out that this world that exists is not one that's in alignment with my core set of values. And uh, it's really out of integrity. And so I can't then go and join the global circus because by joining it, I'm condoning it, right? I'm accepting the fact that it exists, I'm supporting it. And I never wanted to have to speak uh, on behalf of something that felt out of integrity. And so for anyone watching this who's younger, um, I encourage you to follow that sense of knowing that's inside um, that personally led me to like 10 years of off-roading and uh, traveling full time, living in the tropics, living all over the world, uh, really doing an alternative kind of lifestyle, you know, while my peers, let's say that I grew up with, were joining the corporate world and uh, being a rat in the race and all of these things. And it was never something I was willing to participate in. And then when I kind of rejoined the world, as I like to call it, about three years ago, um, I did so with uh, this purview of the fact that things were changing. Things are changing, especially right now. Uh, if anyone knows about <laughs> what's about to happen this weekend, I mean, we not only have the summer solstice, but we have a full moon and a, also an eclipse. And um, it is a major event in a string of major astrological events of 2020. And so whereas we can you know, we can be like ants on the anthill, like little busy bees here talking about business, talking about how things work, 
there's a moment where we have to step back and surrender a little bit and realize that um, there's a greater plan and purpose. And this is not like a conspiracy kind of plan. This is like a universe. This is all meant to be happening. Our own species discovery of ourselves has meaning, has purpose. And our only solace in that is to take a deep breath and to trust and to take a deep breath into initiatives that are working and people who are able to remove themselves from the box because that's really what capitalist economics are today. They are a box, they are a structured way of thinking that kind of hold us in and think bigger and think outside of the box. And so uh, really the main vector that brought me back into the real world, if you will, is um, the decentralization movement because it gave me hope that uh, using blockchain technology, we will be able to decentralize most things, that this kind of top-down authoritarian approach that we've had through our centralized government, centralized healthcare, centralized financial systems, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which has inherently disempowered us because the essence of something centralized is you're giving, so like health is my area, right? You're giving your health away to the doctor or the hospital who doesn't know anything about you actually, right? You who's been living in your body for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if you know, and yet we've shut off that inner sense of connection and knowing because we've given it away. So that's just a little preview. Let's get into talking about these three things that I said I would talk about incentive structures, collaboration, and wellness in this post-capitalist workplace. Like where could we go? So first of all, um, talking about incentives, obviously social impact, booming, as um, really a buzzword and something questionable because can a true social impact business work in a capitalist profit scheme mechanism? And that's, I mean, it's up for debate. It's up for debate. It depends upon what's, what's being done. Um, hopefully, like I loved Asa's project of, of uh, the food saving. So if there is a mechanism there where um, it's incentivized, we'll get into incentivization next, but um, it works for everyone then hallelujah, like those, those projects by nature are going to be supported. You can think of Uber as an example, right? Saved money um, because it was really decentralizing taxi drivers, giving more power back to the driver, right? They weren't owned by, you know, an agency or a centralized taxi union. They could have their own agency to be their own boss. There's a slight flavor of entrepreneurialism there. It also worked for the consumer, right? It's cheaper, it's electronic, you can order it. So these kinds of um, incentive schemes are what's going to, as uh, Robert mentioned, push on the pain points to change behavior. And um, when we think about incentives, we have to think about consumers. Right, so the customers, that's probably you watching this, uh, the company and the employees. And so on a consumer level, like we're living in the age of influencers. I don't know if that uh, has like rung true to you yet, but it's a real thing that uh, these, the mythic gods, which once let's think of ancient Greek, uh, that then in our think of all throughout the 1900s became real movie stars. And then as we come into the 2000s, they've become our social media stars. These are our great gurus who we look up to, who we see doing something and we want to, you know, get a part of it and engage. And so how we make choices, who we associate with, uh, it's really how we live becomes part of a movement. And um, so that that quality of, of how consumers will decide is, is how they will choose where to spend their money. And so for a lot of the companies that I consult for, uh, we're looking at who you collaborate with, right? And what story you're telling. And that's why, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement has made such a huge impact uh, upon companies and, and their need to decide which side they're on. Um, and yeah, so from there, we'll talk about the company bottom line, obviously, is what naturally comes next. Um, the model in capitalism has been to take advantage of people. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, this is really what the economic structure is about. It's about using someone else's right, work hours. So you might be an employee for a company and the money that you are making for the company is less than what they're making off of your work. Yeah. And that's how salaries and things are put forth. And um, when we look into, like, if anyone's read Noam Chomsky's work, 
um, or the person who really changed my life, a Japanese literary critique critic called uh, Kojin Kuratani. Um, it's this idea of moving beyond the, the nation state capital interlocked bromelian rings, that there are only um, three different ways that humans have experimented with throughout history on how to e e really exchange between one another. Karl Marx used the term Bechner, which was exchange. It is the way in which um, we govern our economics between us. And so the first one would be plunder and redistribution. And this is like what feudalism became. It is essentially the state, you know, who takes everything from people and then redistributes it as they want. Um, so more of like a socialist model there, maybe. Um, reciprocity is another way to exchange. Maybe the first one could be more of a communist model and reciprocity would be more socialist. And in that, um, the second of gift and exchange in reciprocity, this is like, this is a nation. And whether that's a nation of tribal people who, you know, live out in the wilderness, very isolated, it's normally a smaller community thing. The way that they exchange with one another is through gifting. Yeah, any kind of indigenous tradition, you'll see gifting quite often. And then of course we have commodity exchange, which is uh, capital and capitalism. And um, I give you good X, you give me good B, they have a set or a, a not set, a non-fixed value, uh, and we will trade upon that. And often in the modern workplace, um, we really determine our value by how much we're paid, yeah, our salary. And so the detachment of that is going to be um, a major breakthrough in trying to find what Chomsky calls l'idée fixée, um, this fixed idea, this, this, this thing that we haven't come up with. How do we organize ourselves in a way in which we're liberal, right? Exchanging openly, progressive, and yet it's not confining. And uh, so this new method of exchange, I do believe the closest thing that I found to it, and I've been searching for 13 years, is decentralization and using blockchain technology to be able to create new value where there wasn't value before, of course, using technology. And then moreover, redistribute it in a way that it's not given out by some big mama or papa or uncle Sam. And it is for the people by the people. And this, this quality of rather than top down, this bottom up approach is, is really where humanity is tipping towards. So um, in talking about employees, this is the third part of incentive structures. Um, one of the projects that uh, I work with, the foundation of the Institute for Aliveness, which is uh, the, the institute that I founded to try to get some of these principles into the world, is um, to work with health days. So when you think about incentive structures, um, health days are a much better idea, if I do say so myself, than sick days. All right? So when we, when we look at these worker bees or the anthill ants, and uh, we look at you know, what, how are they incentivized? And um, I, I, it feels relevant right now to say a quote that a friend of mine always says, if you are not working on creating your dream, then you're working on um, helping someone else's dream. And that, that idea of like what, like, what are you doing, right? Are you following your inner self? And also spoke to this uh, quite a bit, which is beautiful. But um, if you are incentivized to get sick, right? that by the company or by the structure or by the society, then you will uh, value getting sick. And so we have to look at similar value structures like that to create this post-capitalist workplace. Um, so I know I'm short on time, so I'll just go through these last two points of collaboration, uh, looking at streamlining, streamlining, minimizing, collaborating uh, between systems and optimization. So the more that companies start to um, work together to share resources, um, whether that's like think a human resources department, if there were some kind of outsourced company, we're seeing so much, especially in the age of um, remote work, right? We're seeing so much outsourcing of these different segments and parts where companies used to have to do it on their own, but now there can be a company that just specializes in outsourcing. Um, and so as we see technology starting to help the optimization of uh, business at large, um, there will be more collaboration and if it's done with a good spirit if if the values of the company are known and not just the bottom line but let's say the triple bottom line uh then there will be a lot of opportunity for growth in in not like a capitalist gdp kind of growth but a growth of impact upon society um 
And so on a microscopic level, collaboration looks like working together and not competing. And uh, really what capitalism has bred is competition. And that's of course how any species um, on one level it improves. That's definitely how humans get stressed and anxious and sick as we see today, as we see you know, in, in C-suite executives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people today are really, really sick. Burnout has become a thing. I mean, that was still 10 years ago. It was like, oh, right, you're suffering from burnout. But now it's it's so accepted widely as a affliction that happens from our modern human condition and the ways in which we work. So um, a couple of minutes, couple this of minutes over, uh, Andy, if you want to. Okay, I'll finish up. So this is this is an awakening of internal ethics beyond Judeo-Christian um, judgment of our own set of values uh, from emotional intelligence and our own awareness. Um, so then the third part is wellness. Um, and I'll just say that not taking advantage of people is great. Uh, and that the more that we kind of come in into terms with um, a sense of that inner direction of like, what am I really doing here on a bigger picture? And that's a question that each of you can take with you um, in your family life, in your work life. If you're a business owner, what am I, re what are we really doing here? And if you can stop and zoom out and take that bigger picture perspective, it will tend to uh, provide answers that will be benefit, benefiting all, not just a single source. Thank you. Wow. Thank you to another, uh, tour de force so much detail and so many perspectives and layers to that so hopefully we'll get an, a chance to unpack uh some of that in the uh, in the dialogue uh, later but thanks again for joining us andy and giving us the pleasure of the bird song in the background as well that was a nice backdrop <laughs> so last and very certainly not least uh silla elworthy silla thanks for joining us um again uh, an incredible uh, achievements throughout your life um pieces you know uh, nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize I read and uh, I guess the piece that seems to be most relevant for this conversation is your latest uh, work on a business plan for peace so I'm very curious to see uh, you know where where your work has taken you and why you've come to this point around a business plan for peace and what the essence of that is in terms of how that might help us shift the system so thanks for joining us. Please unmute yourself. You're still muted. Unmute. Okay. Am I unmuted now? Um, I really like what Jim Garrison said at the beginning. A little microbe stopped our world. And exactly that. The pandemic has changed our lives forever. The future could be much brighter than it is today or much darker. And financial crises, unemployment, starvation. In the past, this has led to violence, weapons, and war. But violence, as we know now, is not a solution. And it's obvious that war doesn't work. Afghanistan is in chaos. Iraq isn't stable. And Syria is not peaceful. Today, as you may or may not know, we spend $1.9 trillion on war every year. That's not only profoundly shocking, it's also unnecessary. I've spent 50 years investigating what actually works to prevent war. And the result is the business plan for peace. People write business plans for everything, but nobody had written one for peace. So I did because um, of the background of what I've experienced. And that's starting in 1982 to research, to enable nuclear weapons policymakers to sit down and reach agreements to help end the Cold War. And since then, I've supported 350 local initiatives across the world who use effective methods to build peace. And with minimal funding, these methods have stopped people killing each other all over the world. For example, they've prevented 200 suicide bombers in Pakistan from taking thousands of lives prevented conflict erupting in Kenya, the Congo, Northern Ireland. So investing in peace not only builds economic stability, it creates enough jobs for young people to avoid mass migration. We now know enough to prevent war 
happening. And you may think that's a big statement, but in the business plan for peace, we've created this effective costed plan to do exactly this globally at a fraction of the $1.9 trillion currently poured into the machinery of war. So have a look at our website, the business plan for peace, where we demonstrate the methods that work to prevent violence escalating into war. And I'll just give you four examples. The first one is called Architectures for Peace. And that's what Nelson Mandela, who I worked with for four years to set up the elders, the architecture for peace, which he set up when he came out of jail in 1989, because he knew that otherwise there would be civil war before elections could take place. And that consisted of peace councils from the national level right down to the village level. And their job was to develop a peace plan for their area, which had to be put into place as soon as violence erupted. Um, and it worked so well, and I lived in South Africa for 10 years, it worked so well that it prevented most violence and there certainly was never a risk of civil war in South Africa before elections could take place in uh, 1994. The second example I'd like to give you is something that uh, Robert Rubenstein if, uh, referred to uh, a little disparagingly earlier on impact investment. Now, um, if you look at investment in UN Sustainable Development Goal number 16 for peace, it's the least invested of all the SDGs. And this is shocking because if you don't have peace, you can't have education, you can't have health and so forth. So we've got together with uh, the Impact Summit organized by Phoenix Capital every year in The Hague, in the capital of The Hague, and with Cadmos Peace Investment Fund. And it, with these experts, we're providing a series of examples of how uh, in, impact investors can actually put their money behind the prevention of war in, we've now got 25 different examples of how this works and produces either a reputational dividend or an actual dividend. On the other side of the coin from investment to divestment, uh, we're working with now, I think it's 100 uh, pension and endowment funds to question exactly what are they putting their funds into and what are the criteria that they, that they apply to encourage them to build those criteria to forbid investment in weapons production and particularly weapons trading, because it's the availability of weaponry that really drives most localized wars and localized wars are the ones that take the most lives all over the world. So these, are, these methods that we're using go right to the causes of why war starts. And in this, we've discovered something really interesting and it's called U2P. And it's a document called Understand to Prevent that was produced by seven NATO nations. And they examined how well soldiers and the military can actually prevent war. And it's a fascinating document. So we're now working with the ministries of defense in initially three NATO countries to build a budget for conflict prevention. They've all got defense budgets. Until you put a budget behind prevention of war, which soldiers are very good at, they've, they've got the equipment, they've got the training and so forth, you don't actually get prevention happening. So to sum up, for the first time in history, you can now invest in making peace profitable. You can help channel military skills and discipline into the prevention of armed conflict. And you can build country by country the structures necessary for a peaceful future. So just as it was thought impossible to stop slavery, to end the Cold War, to bring down the Berlin Wall, we now have the power to, to do something thought equally impossible, namely to resolve conflict 
without going to war. So we've got a choice, either to carry on investing time, energy and money in a system that produces millions of refugees, shatters business opportunities and breeds terrorists for generations to come, or finally, systematically to invest in the technologies of peace. So I'll finish there just to be brief and thank you. Thank you, Silo. I'm not going to let you off the hook that easily. You've still got four minutes to go. And there's, <laughs> been, uh, there's been a few questions. Um, and I would also be uh, love to know more about this investing in peace. So mm. can you give us like when you say the impact investors can potentially in invest in the prevention of war, can you give us some ex more detail on that, some examples maybe? Yeah, let me give you one example from Kenya. As you probably remember, uh, in 2008-9, there were huge uh, riots in Nairobi and many other cities in Kenya uh, over the um, mishandling of the elections. M I think over a thousand people were killed. Businesses were trashed all over the big cities. And what happened was that some of those who had such businesses thought we've got to do something about this not happening again. And so they got together with the locally led initiatives for conflict prevention. Um, uh, these are incredible people who risk their lives to actually stop conflict erupting in the townships and then spreading to the center of the city. Result, 2013 elections, no violence, 2017 elections, no violence. That's what happens when businesses get together with local experts, local networks, the people who are completely and totally underfunded, give them some equipment, some training if necessary, some encouragement, and then work together with them to actually stop conflict. Does that give you an idea? Yeah, great. So essentially the businesses, are, they partner with the experts in conflict prevention, let's say probably both financially and with their expertise. Yeah, um, and the kind of, I'll just give you one more, more example if I may. Um, and that's, I think this is a wide open opportunity for insurance and shipping industries, because if you've got tankers going through a narrow strait, bringing oil out of, the, out of the Middle East, for example, and if there's war on either side of those straits, your tankers are gonna be stuck there and th they may be blown up by the insurgents. So it's in your interests to examine the likelihood of war in the areas in which you operate, and then to help invest in those who are able to prevent it. It's really a no-brainer until you, until you really start thinking about it. So we've got, I think, 25 examples that I could uh, send anybody who's interested in how this works and how to do it. Well, that would be great. Let's get them up on the UBiverse so they're available for everybody to see. That'd be fantastic, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Sela. Wow, what a diversity of perspectives. And um, when we kind of think about business, if you said to somebody, you know, what would you think would be the discussion on a panel about business? I don't think anyone would have thought of the diversity of perspectives uh, that we've had here today. So um, thank you all very much uh, for the contribution so far. And um, let's open it up now uh, to the panel uh, for discussion. And let's see if we can focus on, given you know, our own experience and everything we've heard uh, so far, what do we, if we were to try to find like really, this term acupuncture points came up, really the key acupuncture points in the context of business for enabling this transition, assuming to, for the moment that we're not gonna get the legislation out of government uh, quickly enough. Um, what is it? What are the key acupuncture points and levers from a, from, a, from the business con, uh, perspective that could really shift things fast? So um, open it up to to all the panelists and feel free to interact directly with each other. If you want to build on anything somebody has already said uh, or ask some questions about it, feel free to do that too. Yeah, I just I wanted to share actually that you know often we 
aren't able to focus on something because the cycles, the political cycles can be so short, you know, five years, three years, I'm in office, I'm not. Um, and those decisions that are made then don't have the, the kind of the longevity. So these moonshots then became really popular. And now we're recognizing that maybe the moonshots are way too far and we need to be working closer to earth. So it is the sort of the balancing act between what it is that you're trying to aim for and retrocasting how you're going to get there in smaller steps. So forecasting it, hey, look, this is where we'd like to get to, for example, sustainability is becoming an, a, an increasingly more important intuitive stance for business. So how do we create sustainable businesses when all of our supply chains, for example, someone might say, are completely misaligned with adapting to the climate crisis, what do we do? So I think that, you know, one of the biggest opportunities that we have today is in identifying where we need to make these changes and recognizing that we we begin at least, even if it does seem like such a, a large issue that we are able to break it down into smaller steps to create these milestones. So despite the fact that it can be overwhelming and we can all be overwhelmed, we're all, you know, in in the course of the last three months, at least once overwhelmed, uh, being at home, not having the freedom that we're so used to. So what can we do to overcome that? Um, we can be ready for the process that is about to occur by making that first step towards it, at least. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tia. And do you or anybody else have any answers to that question? So you said that, you know, we do the, the visioning and then we do the backcasting. And we find where do we need to focus on to make the changes? Have we, has anybody got any insights on that already? What are the key points that we would need to focus on, do you think? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take like um, a little image that just popped up in my head was the environment or the global commons, merge that with sort of the digital commons, th thinking in terms of the, the digital layer, which we never had, you know, um, for, for a good portion of my childhood, but now we do. And it's so important to get information to people who are in need of that information as quickly as possible. I used to laugh when we did this innovation workshop with Coca-Cola that we can get a Coca-Cola to the middle of a village in India where a tetanus jab isn't available. So the distribution channels for uh, you know, a beverage were better than the health service. And so it really helped us to identify what could we piggyback on the distribution layers of Coca-Cola to provide health education to people who would otherwise not get access to it. So there are formats out there. Perhaps we can piggyback those. There are opportunities to, to work in partnership. And I often say to scale a business that is in capitalism, you need competition. But to scale a business that is a cooperative, you need community. Today, we need community. We're doing many of these same projects together. Why not work together and know that, hey, look, this is something that, that we're working on. This is where we're going to plug in. Um, that's something that's really fascinating. So the moment that we start creating competition, it goes to that agonismus and sin agonismus in Greek, which is, you know, compete to kill, kind of like gladiator style, get into the ring and one of us walks out alive. We don't need that kind of business anymore, that kind of rivalry. Put the guns down, like somebody said. Who has which piece of the puzzle, basically? Yeah. Anyone else? I'd just like to pick up something that Diana's just written in the chat. She says, does anyone think that if we carry on sharing this in kind of info, we might cause changes that move faster than governments? Seeing as we know governments aren't doing it, is this a way forward? I couldn't agree more with you. Um, just to go from governments to the other end of the spectrum, at the local level, local people, there are three, there are now 1800 separate locally led peace initiatives actually stopping people killing each other all over the world, but most of them don't have any funding at all. So. If you go on another website, I'm not advertising my own, uh, the website to go to there is Peace Direct. And they're the people who have access to all these initiatives all over the world if you want to get some detail on it. And I'd love to ask Robert a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, are you there? Yes, you are. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, you were talking about, slightly disparagingly, about impact investment. 
Yeah. Um, if you were an impact investor, how could I engage you in investing in the prevention of war? Well, there were there were some initiatives kind of like offshoot of the Gavi bombs, but sure. for peace. And we actually had a gentleman from from Finland who was creating <clears throat> this vehicle for institutional investors sure. to put money in that that would uh, address that. But fundamentally, I don't look for impact investors. I mm-hmm. prefer irresponsible investors and criminals. Mainly, they have more <laughs> money, they have a much better sense of humor, and they're much more pragmatic. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the impact investors, and in, we get calls I don't know, five or 10 a week requests for help with fundraising. Can you introduce me to these impact investors? And most of the time, there's a lot of chat. There's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of talk, but there isn't much check writing. And uh, so I just approach investors Mm -hmm. with an investment opportunity that provides whatever market rate return is at the moment uh, and uh, a measurable social environmental added value. I don't even like the word impact investing because it gives this connotation to the traditional investors. Oh, it's a charity. Yeah. And to the, and to another group of, of endowments, particularly out of the United States is that, well, the measurement is not good enough. So we can't really start until the measurement. So that's an excuse of not doing anything. We yeah, have to sure. wait until the measurement is ideal before we do any. So I, I just don't want to make a distinction between an impact investor or an investor. I prefer to work with accredited institutional investors, and particularly I like um, family offices sure. because um, the pension funds will never, ever, ever invest in a non-tier one fund. Non-tier one is like KKR is sure. tier one, Carla. So if you're not there, you're never going to get a dime from them. But they'll listen to you and they'll tell you, oh, Skillers, tell me all about this. This is fascinating. And after a year and a half of going back and forth to them, oh, I'm sorry, the investment committee said no, but let's keep in touch. So the yeah, but, family offices are much more interesting. They're small bureaucracies and they have a lot of money. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And the there's um, quite a nice Cadmos Peace Investment Fund that people are, people like that are beginning to put their money in. But... Um, what, what I'm interested in with the divestment issue is mm-hmm. how do we um, up the criteria for divestment from, just as there was a huge divestment trend from fossil fuels into mm-hmm. renewables, massive. And mm-hmm. that was mainly because renewables be- provided a better return eventually, but there was a risk with factor lower in risk. the middle. With yeah. lower risk. Yeah, but in the middle of the process, there was a lot more um, resistance to that trend, but then it sure. changed. Now, how could we make the trend to to how could we make it reputationally advantageous to divest from weapons production and invest in the prevention of war? Well, that has happened for for quite a while. I, I remember there was a kind of BBC panorama documentary about. Dutch pension funds investing in cluster bomb manufacturers. Mm-hmm. Big crisis. The CEOs of the uh, CIOs of the pension funds were caught deer in the headlights that they're investing in cluster bomb manufacturers. So what happened? In two years' time, the investment in ESG went from 47 billion to 480 billion, mm-hmm. which is not possible to do it properly. But what happened? They kicked out cluster bomb manufacturers out of their portfolio. They might have had $2 million of a $5 billion portfolio. And now the whole $5 billion is an ESG fund because we got rid of the cluster bomb manufacturers. So how many listed cluster bomb manufacturers are there in the world? Not many. What is their total market cap? Even less. So I That's understand That's because they're illegal. Well, there, there, there are people who make parts for cluster bomb manufacturers. And so this, it was just, it was a knee jerk reaction of a lot of pensioners saying, I don't want my money going for cluster bomb manufacturers. So that has happened Mm. and that continues to happen. 
But remember, most of the companies in the world are not on the stock market. And yeah. most of the investments are done in liquid assets, 70% stocks and bonds. But most of the world is not on the stock market. And the value mm -hmm. of, the sec of the primary market is very small. The secondary market is very the, what's traded after the IPO. So, but everybody thinks every company in the world is on the stock market and you have to kind of go after them. But there's loads and loads of companies. I personally, I don't really believe we will create an economy based on well-being by divesting from uh, ExxonMobil to Cisco, you know, or uh, why is it that the companies that score so well on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index are the most toxic? PepsiCo for diabetes, uh, Shell and BP for carbon intensity, Unilever for toxic cosmetics and processed food, but they all score really well on the Dow Jones Sustainability. I think it's more the illiquid space, more the companies that are not listed, the ones that are doing the innovation that don't have the stranded assets. So um, I, I try to focus more on the, let's call it more the illiquid space, private equity, public mm -hmm. transport infrastructure, uh, real estate, uh, secondary market of the development finance institutions, second generation engagement. Those things I think can have a much greater influence on changing the economy then, okay. you know, going from this one to that one, Nestle okay. to Pepsi. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you for that, uh, that kind of uh, meta level. Let's, um, uh, Andy, there's been a couple of questions about, because you mentioned in your talk, the possibility of, there was this theme of decentralization and then particularly how we might use blockchain uh, to facilitate that. Um, could you, there's been some interest in the chat. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm just appreciating the generational um, longitude that we have on this panel and the wisdom that comes from what's on my right side of the screen. And like the, I'm probably the youngest person here, the, like there is, there is a really big need to fuse between baby boomers and their expertise and millennials to really come together as systems are completely changing. And um, I mean, I'll get into the blockchain, but I mentioned before about the astrology of 2020. Um, and I'm live streaming tomorrow for Abracadabra TV, all about the astrology uh, for 2020. So check that out if you want, I can put the link. But um, effectively, we have all the outer planets aligning in Capricorn, which this hasn't happened in about 4,000 years. Um, maybe 12,000, depending upon what timeline you're looking at. But the last time we had anything relatively similar planetarily to right now was like French Revolution era. <laughs> so the, the quality of disruption and the um, acuteness of the pivot that humanity is about to take uh, is significant. And um, while, while we were talking, my uh, daily Osho Zentero card popped up on my screen and it was the patience card. And so clearly that's something that needs to come into this discussion of like, it's, it's all happening. It's all already happening, right? This wage for peace, whatever. And we tend to have this desire to protest and want it now and all of this. And it's like, the more that we can do this, the more that we can steward our own lives. Peter, you had asked about what are the things that we can actually act upon? Our daily routine, right? Our headspace, our amount of calm. Uh, how much we can love the people around us. Like that's what will move humanity forward. So um, in looking at blockchain technology and uh, Tia can also speak to, to this, um, she's authored a book on it. Uh, essentially the decentralization te blockchain technology is taking um, what would be a glorified database and uh, securely putting it into peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks of decentralized nodes so that information um, data at large is shared between these nodes in a way where it's not centralized on your Google Drive or whatever it might be. And so the, the applications of blockchain are many. Um, unfortunately, well, I, there's no need for a value judgment. One of the first ways that uh, blockchain kind of made its um, impact upon the world was through cryptocurrencies. It was through finance. Of course, um, you want to program al algorithms and um, get 
blockchain technology to um, improve working on humans' greed. And so Tia had mentioned in the chat earlier about ICOs and the boom um, that happened all throughout 2017, 2018. And I was very much part of that and seeing really the ethics and the morals of the individuals. And when it comes down to business at the end of the day, you want to know who the person is who's driving the company. And the more that you are self-aware, the more you'll be able to go in with kind of a detection of like, is this person someone who I actually want to um, invest in? Are they someone that's good? I mean, Robert was mentioning this with his idea of the crook investors. Um, and so, whereas the financial market is one vertical where blockchain technology can be employed, there's so many, like we look at voting, for example, um, of course, all around the world, there are massive schemes where, you know, the votes of the voters, everyone go out and vote, but it's like, are your votes actually going to be counted? Is it not going to be massively skewed at the end of the day? And we need a technology that is unfungible, unable to be edited um, or messed up by any centralized force to truly ensure transparency. And that is the movement that we are going towards is um, collaboration, so peer-to-peer -peer network, decentralization, empowerment, that I have agency and self-sovereignty over my own life, my health, my money, my et cetera, et cetera, whatever vertical you want to go in. And then I have an ability to um, have my voice be carried forth and not just be, have it said that it's carried forth. There's a, there's a quality of transparency. So I don't know, see if you want to pick that up. Great. Thank you. Uh, also, have you got uh, what's your sense uh, of having listening to things at the moment? This question of uh, leverage points and uh, where could we best put our attention to make the biggest impact? I mean, it's a super interesting dialogue uh, and just uh, so much wisdom in the panelists here. So it's super interesting <clears throat> for me. Um, it well, it really comes down to, um, I mean, looking at the possibilities also where we are. Again, coming back to the what has happened now over the last couple of months and this little virus who which literally just just made the whole world come to a standstill over just like well <clears throat> it went from one day to another it felt like it, it just poof, crashed and um and now when we look at it like we we've, we've done surveys of course here in Sweden too and it comes to like to, well, people have less time to consume, like 50% spend more time in the nature, like a lot of more people are home, uh, in their homes, like really reflecting, going, you know, really like going into themselves, but also like, if we if we touch on my, on my uh, agenda, which is food, of course, like a lot of people are staying at home and cooking, who's like, who's actually taking, who's actually embracing the possibilities that this whole thing just changed and like for me it's interesting to actually look at and see like what behavioral changes that this actually this this pandemic actually led to which of those are actually going to be permanent like you know there was this there was this picture a few months back and it was the I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was the picture of the Himalayas and it was from India. And actually like people were just saying, wow, look, this is the first time I've ever seen the mountains because it's just been, you know, like they've never been seen before. Um, and how do we now go back to the old way when we've like discovered things like this? So for me, it's interesting to see like which of the behaviors that we actually had to adapt to now that these digital conferences, for example, and everything else, like what can we actually have that becomes permanent? Um, and just listening to people in my, like my peers and, and my network of people, I mean, it's interesting to just see how those behavioral just changed overnight and that it's now a norm, nor like a new norm, like a new normal. Um, and how people are just like taking a slower pace and really just starting to like both reflect but but also you know just really considering their own values in a in a way which i've not seen or heard before so um it's yeah it's just um, interesting to see what follows here but as i said before new behaviors demands new businesses that's really 
like it's really needed so i'm yeah that's my take mm. thanks yeah we had um uh, when we were on one of the sessions a few days ago a guy called jan rotmans who's a professor of uh transitions and stuff and he was saying look this is the first of the crises you know it's by no means the last we're actually about to hit a cascade of crises including around climate and other things and like you're saying those are going to massively impact behavior so how does because a business a lot of businesses have suffered through the current um crisis mm. so how do we um use that opportunity to create businesses that can somehow thrive positive businesses let's say that can somehow thrive and take advantage of the crisis and help to direct people's energy and resources in another direction that seems to me one of the big questions that entrepreneurs could be asking themselves at the moment for sure i totally agree with you completely and i mean i it 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 takes a lot i think you know just it's going to it's going to demand a lot from everybody like not just businesses it, like it's going to be demanding a lot from like society politicians individuals everybody um and like i think uh, diane here in the comment is also saying that we have to be very strong to make sure we stay on a slow path and i totally i couldn't agree more it totally like demands focus from everybody and, and that's going to be tough because we have really gotten used to a certain lifestyle especially i'm talking for sweden here you know like but we, we're used to like being able to do whatever we used to do before the pandemic travel everywhere you know everything is just like an abundance of everything all the time and it, it, it's going to be it's tough it's going to be tough but it's we need to yeah, right well the, people we're running uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go around everybody now robert give everyone a chance to wrap up because we're just running out of time here so we'll do it in reverse order we'll go uh, uh silla andy tia Robert and Asa uh, to finish off. Um, just some last comments. Um, any last gems of wisdom, insights uh, to share uh, before we finish off? So, um, Scylla, you want to start us off? Um, yes. Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Um, I, I think where I connect with the other panelists is that um, I am profoundly convinced from working with people who stop people killing each other all over the world, that the inner work, the, um, the self-knowledge, the self-empowerment is absolutely vital for the future. Because when um, the proverbial hits the fan, then that's when we need that inner strength and inner power so that we don't... Um, given to our fear so that we stay present. And I've seen people stop a riot just by how centered they were and how calm they were. It may be as a result of having acupuncture, it may be as a result of doing years of self-inspection. It may be as a result of any kind of regular practice. But to me, these two things go hand in hand. Action to stop violence, action to stop war with the inner power that comes from self-knowledge and self-worth. And so we've just recently um, put out a tiny booklet. It's called The Mighty Heart, um, How to Resolve and Transform Conflict, wherever you are, whether it's in your family, in your community, or in your company. And Somebody earlier, one of us referred to the amount of stress there is in C-suites now, and it's there, it's all the way through business now. So this little booklet could be helpful. It's called The Mighty Heart, and you can find it on our website, www.thebusinessplanforpeace.org. It's really been great to be with you, and thank you, Peter, for facilitating this so beautifully. Thanks, Silla. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, Andy, some last uh, words of wisdom. I mean, Celia said all the words I would say. It's all about the the, the self-knowing journey. It's, um, yeah, I mean, how can you know yourself better every subsequent day? Um, the work in the world will reflect the work that you do on yourself. And, um, 
So whereas we can value these systems, like I said before, the little ants and the anthill, let's also be the, the eagle, the condor flying overhead, seeing it from a bigger picture and um, remembering, remembering, really having a embodied experience of remembering that we are together. Um, and so for my last little moment, I want to switch the camera and take a second with you guys, just if everyone takes a really deep breath, allow your belly to rest, widen the ribs, make sure there's space between the back teeth, soften the eyes, and remember. Yeah. Okay. That's all you can go on. I'll keep showing you that though. Oh no, I was happy to stay there for a bit actually. <laughs> no, great. Thank you, Andy. Great. Uh, Tia. Um, well, I mean, thank you, Andy. I, I needed a little bit of a fill of, of Hawaii. Um, you know, I strongly believe that our noetic evolution has adapted to change according to our physical surroundings, our rooms, our buildings are these immersive multi-sensory experiences that we are designing, but they're also rewriting the expression of our genetic code. It's called the epigenome. And it can shift our humanity. We are in the liminal space, the chrysalis, the moment that the caterpillar goes into this cocoon, whether to become a moth or a chrysalis to become a caterpillar, it is that moment of the imaginal cells where the imaginal cells hold both the form of the caterpillar as well as the butterfly. And I think in this space, we have the opportunity to really evolve wherever it is that we are and to take that forward in our stride. It's an important move that, that we're in. So it really does feel that often strategy doesn't consider what could terribly go wrong. And yet we are extremely aware of what can go wrong. So to build a strategy without that contingency is um, is not a strategy. So start strategizing. And you know, if, if all of us, if we're thinking in terms of business, if all of us were to take on at least some position in the business or to aid a business or to support businesses that are regenerative in nature and can really create uh, jobs in this area, then people won't be asking you, well, I don't really know what to do because there's so much to be done. Um, so I leave it with you. And I think that there's, yeah, such an amazing conversation that that can be taken forward from henceforth. So Peter and all the panelists, thank you very much for your time and, and all of the audience, thank you very much for, for joining. Thanks Tia, thank you. Robert. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's important to remember that this work is farming, not hunting. Uh, financial sector are hunters. They're incentivized for short-term behavior. So I'm quite optimistic, long-term, short-term, a bit pessimistic. I'm happy to see that at least Europe has focused more on the individual and not only bailing out the banks and the large companies like the United States is doing. Um, important thing to remember the two largest employers in the world don't use tech. It's small scale agriculture and hospitality. So if you're looking to create jobs, that's where you should be doing it. And they don't use very much tech. I know everybody's obsessed with tech for 10X. Uh, and finally, not everyone should be an entrepreneur. There are too many accelerators, too many incubators. It's not for everyone. It doesn't mean that you're not a brilliant, wonderful, loving person, but not everyone should be an entrepreneur and that uh, people should really rethink. I think in business important, but too much um, accent is given to making everyone an entrepreneur. And I think that's been actually quite detrimental. Uh, thank you for organizing this. And um, I put my email down if anybody wants to reach me. Thank you, stay well. Great, thank you, Robert. And uh, also to finish us off. Yeah, thank you so much for this panel and all the discussion. Um, I think that we really are at 
uh, a point of time now where we have been given time to both evolve and change and reflect, and it's time to do things differently now. Um, so take the time to reflect and understand like that we need to change the norm and maybe the businesses that what they used to be um, and that they can actually be pivoted and done differently. So um, I just want to say um, stay true to yourself and to your mission. And I agree with Robert, not everybody should be an entrepreneur, but everybody could be a change agent for themselves um, and also for the world. All right, thank you. Great point to, to, to leave it. Um, yeah, just a couple of things that stuck. For some reason, these two statistics are sticking with me. One is $1.2 trillion worth of food thrown away every year, and the other is $1.9 trillion spent on war every year. And I was kind of, oh, that's a interesting. And I, there was no immediate like link I was to make, I could make, but I was that's, that's interesting. I think... Um, Really what this panel, a couple of things stuck with me is on the one hand, uh, Andy, thank you for bringing in the archetypal level of uh, astrology and this and this idea of patience. Yeah. So we're in a time, things are moving, they're going to keep moving. And uh, it reminds me actually of uh, <clears throat> the way of the white cloud or something like that. Jim, you'll know the real title of the book. But was uh, I was reading that and it was about reincarnation and things. And they were saying, look, if you're doing something that's really close to your heart that you really care about, you will complete it, even if you don't do it in this lifetime. And that was such a relief. It was like, oh, dude, I don't have to get it all done now. Great. I'll come back and kind of complete the work later. So the patience is a good bit. And then just, you know, just the quality of the people on the on the panel. Um, great hope in terms of the possibilities uh, to, to show that it can be done at all these different levels, at investment, at new businesses, at investing in peace and preventing war, that, you know, we know how to do this collectively. And that's, and that's very heartening. So thank you all for that. And uh, Jim, over to you to finish off. Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, this has probably been the most uh, broadly framed, far-reaching panel on business uh, that I uh, have come across in some time. <laughs> when, as Peter says, when we're talking about the astrology of fate to investing in peace and moving beyond war and, and, uh, and the importance of inner health and uh, well-being. You know, one gets a sense of how all the categories now of human endeavor are beginning to fuse. And that's the note with which I wanted to end is the fusion of our siloed categories. Because the more business is aware of the importance of the interior, the more business is aware of the importance of peace and conflict resolution, the more business is aware of the statistics of wasted food and the mobilization uh, for war, the more business becomes part of the solution. If you think of the Achilles heel, the toxicity at the heart of business historically, they've only been motivated by profit. And the whole movement of profit, people, planet is the movement of business into the rest of the human condition. And I think uh, that is just an important note to make given the quality of the interdisciplinary <laughs> discussion that we have just uh, witnessed. And I think, as I, you know, you made a really important point that, that, that that pulls it all together just a moment ago, you know, that it's, it, it may not be about being an entrepreneur as Robert said, but it is about being a change maker. I think what unites all of us, whether in business or not, is the fact that history is now demanding of each of us that we live large. And what I mean by living large is that we all live our own personal individual lives within the global context 
that the fate of the earth is in the balance. We have about 10 years to turn it around. And somehow each and every one of us are either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. And I think that choice point of a larger context is drawing business into the world and it's drawing all of us into the potential that we were born for. Because I believe we were all born for this moment. I believe that every human being is here for a reason. And that reason is now. And the revelation of the pandemic is the fragility of the human species and the need for literally humanity to rise to solve the problems besetting us. So thank you, panel. This has been extraordinary. Uh, tomorrow, we actually bring to a close this 10-day session on strategies for change. Uh, we were planning to do crowdsourcing and new models for business that can be scaled worldwide. Um, but we're also mindful that tomorrow is Juneteenth. And that's the day in the United States where everyone celebrates the emancipation of the slaves at the end of the uh, Civil War. Uh, we probably wouldn't have noted it had it not been for the killing of George Floyd about three weeks ago and the avalanche cascade of social unrest and protest and activism. Uh, so we're going to take a few moments at the beginning of the program tomorrow to remember Juneteenth and thereby access for all of us one of the most painful pain points in the human condition today. And that is the question of race and the extraordinarily tragic situation that we cannot yet embrace all of us in our beautiful diversity as one. So tomorrow is going to be a, a special day and I hope to see you there again, five o'clock to seven o'clock p.m. Central European time. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone on the panel. It's been brilliant. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Bye everyone. <laughs>